Okay, good morning everyone to the um, second day and uh, actually it's uh, gonna be a premiere because it's the first time I think that we do a hands-on hardware work uh, workshop um, at OSCW and yeah I really like this venue here it's it's an amazing setting um, and I don't know if you have noticed, but um, next door there's some music, there's some rooms where they practice music. So I heard people singing and playing the music instruments. And actually yesterday I was walking around looking for the, uh, for the other room and accidentally I, I entered one of these, the wrong rooms. Uh, but it's okay, now I know how to play the violin. So it's, it's really a nice setting here. Um, Okay, so we're going to do a hardware hands-on workshop and uh, this poses a bit of a difficulty because opposite to software, hardware is not for free and I only have a limited number of them which are on the table here. And uh, this workshop is about um, SpaceCan. Uh, so I'm going to run this workshop like this, that we, um, I'm going to give an introduction about what is SpaceCan and what you can expect from it. And then in the second round, so this will take about 15 minutes. And then in the second part, um, I think, depending on the number of people, we either do it um, twice, this hands-on part. Um, and for this, we, um, we have this table here. And I think we can uh, fit about six people close to the table. And we have six boards and then others can st stand behind them and, and observe. Um, and um, it would be good if those people of you uh, that have um, a Pi board or SDM microcontroller at home, uh, if you would um, let others do this, uh, give pr priority to others who don't have this equipment at home because I think it's easily reproducible at home. So if you have the hardware and kind of the knowledge, you can do this at home, but those of you who don't have any uh, knowledge of uh, microcontroller programming, it would be great for you to actually tr uh, give it a try. Okay, I'm starting now uh, with the um, presentation. So, SpaceCan, it's SpaceCan, that's all about uh, in, the, in the theme of interface standard, uh, standardization. Because if you look around, uh, there are so many um, different CubeSat designs uh, that all more or less solve a similar problem, but in a different way. Uh, in, a, in a way, it's beautiful, but it also leads to incompatibility, and it's not easy for others to understand how you do your systems because it's completely different and you cannot easily share. And this reminds me very much always of this situation with the power plugs, that if you go to another country, you need to bring an adapter because every country has their own idea of how to connect to the power plug. Um, and uh, so there are several aspects to, to this interface, so this mechanical interface um, of these boards and the electrical interface. But the interface I'm talking now about is the um, command and monitoring bus. So that's basically how um, your boards communicate with each other. And you might think that, hey, that's already a system bus because every CubeSat in orbit is using the I2C bus. I think there's no exception to it. And um, the, the most top pro uh, getaway from this workshop should be that you should not use I2C because it was never designed for the use in space. Um, and if you look at uh, some statistics, um, there's quite a lot of um, mission failures. Uh, I'm focusing here on academic, um, so not planet labs and so on, um, but academic university missions mostly. They, they fail because they repeat mistakes of others and most of the times the mistakes, the problems are related to the um, onboard power system and or the communication bus, which is then I2C. 
And um, <clears throat> shockingly, this number is increasing over time. So the failure rate is not decreasing as you would expect with heritage and so on, um, but it's actually increasing. And the reason that people give for this is that they say, yeah, missions become more complex because we do much better, we don't only do a ping, well, some still do, uh, but we do also some really uh, hardcore science and uh, it's very complex. So the other point from this workshop is get rid of complexity, make it uh, simple and robust. And in particular for such critical systems like the power system or the onboard communication, um, they should be working. Even you drop them on the floor or you plug, plug out a cable, they should still continue to work. So if there's a Single point of failure is, should not lead to a loss of your mission. So the onboard system bus, what is it doing? You have uh, um, your master node, which is the onboard uh, um, computer. This is for a centralized design. If you have a decentralized or fragmented uh, CubeSat design, that might be, uh, look different, but you can still use this, uh, the space can, the CAN bus. But normally what you have is you have an onboard computer that is controlling all the other nodes like the power system and the communication system. So it sets the modes and reads telemetry from it. So it's exchanging telecommands from the master to the slave nodes and reading out telemetry from them. And so are you going to send your Im the, the images from your camera or the, the science measurements or um, uh, software dumps over this bus? No, you don't. So this is large volume data, which is not even very critical, so you use a dedicated bus for this, which does not even need to be single point of failure resistant, but would be good if it's two. But for the, um, the system bus, what you send there are telecommands, which could be things like switching on or off a unit, changing the mode, triggering some action like a deployment, and telemetry, which gives you the status of the, uh, of the systems. Of course, there are so many bus systems around. Look on your laptop, you have already, uh, well, there's USB and there's so many others. Um, and also for space qualified bus systems, there are a lot of choices, uh, but most of them are very clunky. Uh, the mill bus, for example, the connector is already bigger than your CubeSat, um, and uh, the other ones are, it's a bit of an overkill. So CAN bus turned out to be the reliable and uh, low cost version of it and it has been standardized to be used in space. And it actually has already flown in space. So wow, let's do this. Um, CAN bus <coughs> is basically the lower layer. <coughs> no, the, 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 the lower two layers. So you have the physical layer, it's your transceiver that uh, makes sure that the, the um, signals are being sent in a differential way and that uh, the voltage levels are at a certain point. But on top of, and this is what you also get with I2C more or less or UART, but on top of that you get the data link layer integrated in hardware uh, which pr um, constructs these frames and makes sure that these frames are being, um, uh, when they are being sent they have a checksum and are being acknowledged from other nodes. So and they have a length, so they're really reliable to be sent back and forth. And actually, a CAN bus comes from automotive, and you can understand that in, in the car, you want to have a correct reading of your sensors, because uh, life depends on it. So that's where it comes from. But then you see the, you have the, the big data field, which is not so big, it's actually a maximum of eight bytes that you can put there in a frame. So zero to eight bytes, that's the maximum. If you have larger data, you have to split this up. Um, but how to interpret this data? This is um, not specified by the CAN standard. So you need to put something on top of this, an application layer protocol. And uh, the ECSS standard that I just mentioned, they are using this um, CAN open protocol, which is nice, but it's a bit complicated. Even for me, I've read this several times and I still don't find it fam familiar to work with the object dictionary and a table and PDOs and whatever these acronyms. It's, uh, yeah, it's a bit too much. So what we did, 
we stick to can open as far as possible to this application layer protocol, but really just simple and robust um, uh, usage of it. Um, just to let you know that basically what can open introduces is that this um, ID identifier, this can identifier, is split up into a function code that determines what this can message is about, and then the node ID which tells to which node this is being addressed or which node is being sending this. Now, uh, to make it fail safe, you have a redundant node, and this is important. So, you have um, two bus systems that run in cold redundancy. If the, the first bus, if you cut the line, for example, it will not work anymore. Or if one of the node participants kind of crashed the bus, which is actually not possible in CAN, as opposed to SQC, but still you can then switch to the redundant bus. So redundancy is a big thing, and that's very important for CubeSats. Actually, you should have redundancy on all levels. And in, in fact, this is a typical layout, onboard computer connected to several nodes. And this is what we're going to replicate now. We have, uh, uh, on both sides of the table, we're going to uh, set up a network with a master node and two slave nodes. Um, these are the services that are implemented in SpaceCAN. Um, I'm just quickly going through it. Uh, redundancy management, make sure that you, uh, the nodes are on the, um, on the active bus. This is done by the master sending out a heartbeat frame, it's just an empty frame. Um, on the bus it considers to be the active one. And the uh, slave nodes, they receive this heartbeat and then they know, okay, that's the correct bus, I stay on this one. If they don't receive the heartbeat, and if there's a timeout of this heartbeat frame, they will switch to the other bus and see if they can um, uh, see the heartbeat there. If not, they go back to the first one and so on until they find the heartbeat. So that's how redundancy management works. Synchronization is similar. It's a frame being sent by the master node in a regular interval, and this is used for the slave nodes to do some uh, time some periodic uh, activity, for example, collection of of sensor data. So in this way you could say that every second all of the nodes are doing their measurements and then um, uh, by this time, time stamp or more or less the, the data. Time distribution, normally on your master node you have a running counter as the spacecraft elapsed time. That basically is your system time. If you have access to a GPS you might have also UTC time on board. And with this time distribution you send this information every now and then to the other nodes. Now the main part is the telecommand and telemetry exchange. Maybe you have noticed that all of this works in a similar way, and that's the thing. It's very simple to understand. It's just the type of message that determines what is being done there. So for telecommands, only the master node can send telecommand commands to other nodes, and uh, slave nodes can reply with telemetry only. So the slave nodes cannot control each other. If you want to do this, then you have to find out another way. It must all be orchestrated through the master node. And the master node sends um, basically the data, which is your telecommand. Yeah? So the question is if there's a possibility to have a multi-master bus. Um, Yes, it's not excluded per se, but um, um, the, um, the, the setup and everything is targeted for a centralized uh, bus system. With a multi-master, you would have to have, the master is the n with the node ID zero. So you can have two masters uh, with the same node ID, but then they have to figure out the mess that it's being created and they have to understand who's talking to who. So it's a bit up to you then how you you sort out this mess, <laughs> let's say. Yeah? Um, the speed? The capacity? Oh yeah, the maximum eight bytes, that's what you can put in a frame. Yeah. It's limited, <coughs> it's not much, uh, because it was intended to be used for um, reporting sensor from the car, uh, but you can um, come up with other ideas on how you s segment 
larger data. If you have a command that is really big, maybe you split it up into a sequential sending of this command. But in, in, in fact, most of the commands that you're going to send is mode changing and switching on, so this is actually short commands, and the telemetry you get back might be a bit larger, but you can split it up in a, in a number of telemetry responses. The important thing is here that we also implemented this message exchange, which is basically you can send a, a large mes message, which is then fragmented and being sent over the bus, but it's not deterministic, so you don't know really when it stops. And deterministic is very important so that you don't overload the bus. Okay, so and that's what we're going to try now, is the, um, the master is sending some telecommands and the slaves are replying. <coughs> Just one tricky thing here is that the, <coughs> the node ID of the telecommands is the node ID of the target slave node. So what you put here in the node ID when you send a telecommand is the ID of the node that this telecommand should go to. And from the telemetry is different way around. You don't send, you set the node ID to the to your own ID, to the slave node that is sending it, so that the master knows who sent me this frame. You will see in the code. This is a setup that you can reproduce at home for less than 100 euro, and you can even go cheaper if you use different hardware. This is uh, PyBoards, they run MicroPython, and um, it's very easy to get started. So, first come, first serve, or I don't know, you play tic-tac-toe or something to decide who's sitting here. Uh, should not be the experts in microcontroller, they should be in the second row, preferably. Um, so we have a place for about 20 people. The other ones can uh, grab a coffee or have a look from, from remote and um, bring your laptop. And it would be good if you have a bit of knowledge of Linux, but you can also use uh, Windows. So it's basically, if you connect the Pi board to your computer, it shows up as a SD drive and you put the code there and then run it. Let's get started. So.
the repositories, links you to the GitLab, and then it's this one, yeah, MicroPython space cam in the library folder. Okay. And then, well, you can git clone it or you can also just download it as you, as you prefer. If you want to clone it, here's the commands. If you want to just download it as a zip file, you can do this as well. I, I do this. In the end, you will have on your laptop a folder like this. Okay. Okay, everyone ready? Um, yeah, so the next thing would be, the challenge number one would be to um, plug in, well, you already plugged in, the microcontrol, um, the Pi board. The challenge number one would be to uh, make a master node, which uh, is more easy because you can then see that it will be blinking, kind of the blinking example. So how to do that? You have the code on your laptop now, and now you just copy it over to the um, to the Pi board, which looks like a SD drive. Okay. You don't need to have uh, copy over all of these files. It's enough to have the lib, the spacecan folder, the main, and the spacecan.conf, the config file. The SpaceCan folder is containing all the, the MicroPython modules for the, for the, for the SpaceCan. The lib is just, um, I put the logging part as an extra module to make it more modular. The main Pi is, that's actually the file that when you reboot your Pi board, it looks first for this file and runs it, and runs any code in this file. So that means you can, from there you can then import other files and thereby write your program. And that's just a configuration file to have the default configuration. Um, good. Yeah, thumbs up if you're there, if you're ready. Just copy it to there. That's the nice thing about the Pi boards because uh, it's not like a C board where you have to compile, flash it. No, no, no. You can put the code just by copying there. And in fact, now it's the question how to run the code. Anyone else, uh, the Pi board has some experience? Sorry? Um, not yet. There's two ways now. So in order to run the, um, this example, whoops, I forgot to tell you one more thing. <laughs> you go in this docs folder, there's a um, master.py file. Please, this file and this file, copy it to the, um, select it and copy it to the, to the root directory next to the main.py. Okay, take those two files because that's containing the code.
So now on your uh, on your Pi board you will have lib space scan folder and you will have uh, the main file, this config file, and then master and a slave.py file. Okay? So now the question is how to run this. There's two ways. One way would be to, uh, as I say, when the, the PyBot reboots, it automatically starts the main.py. So what you can do is to refer to the master um, file and to start the code in the master file, you just import the file. So that would be import master. So you can open the, the main.py and add a second line, which is import master. Okay, so like this, yeah. Now you, um, that's the thing. Normally you should do a, I always do a soft reboot of the, of the board, but let's try first with the hard reboot, <laughs> which is just plug out uh, or disconnect it from the USB and then connect it again. You have to, yeah, you have to save it. So, and then, Katie, I see your, your, it was successful because it's blinking. So you will see, um, you will see a number of LEDs blinking. So there's a blue LED, is permanently on, that denotes that this is the master node. Um, and then there's a red LED, which is the heartbeat. So it's sending these heartbeat frames every uh, two per second. And then there's also the green one, which is the sync once every second. So these signals are being sent from the master node independent if a slave node is listening or not. So it just send it, sends it. Okay. Is everyone blinking? Yeah. There's another way to do this, to run a code. So one thing is to, to put it in, in, in the main.py or call it from there. But uh, there's a more interactive way, and this is the nice thing about Pi boards. You can connect to it via a serial port. Um, maybe not all of you will be able to do it because, or not. So you need to connect to it like a, like a serial. So for example, I always use screen, but there's other programs like Qt.com or Hyperterminal was used on Windows many years. Uh, I don't know what's uh, um, putty. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, so it, it would be uh, if if at least one of you can manage this, that would be nice. So you need to be a member of the dial-out group. Does it make sense what I'm saying? Has any one of you ever did some serial, connected to a serial device? Yeah. Yeah, so. Um, Um, what are you using? Screen? Ah. Okay, it could be, it could be that if, um, if you, uh, let's say, modify a file and you save it or you copy something on the PyBot, 
there's a red LED is blinking, it's on, you should not disconnect because it might be that maybe the file system is now corrupted. So you know how to do it, please support. Yeah, Serial port. Outrage. Outrage. It's a 9600. Asking. The default. Default. 9600. Yeah. Sorry. So to start from zero. Who managed to connect via the serial port, via terminal, uh, screen, for example? Let's see if it's installed. You need to install it. It's just a small program. So there's several programs you can use to connect uh, to a serial port, but the most easy one is screen, which is just a terminal. And uh, the address usually is this ACM0. This is how your board shows up. And the nice thing about this is that you then get a terminal, and then you are basically on the board. And you are um, communicating with the live Python interpreter on the board. So you can make a LED blink, you can run code directly on the board. There's no compile, flash, debug cycle. And um, yeah, you see something, yeah? Good. Now the thing is that if you have it both in the main file and also you want, so either you use the main file or you use um, the, the live terminal. Because what you can do now is you first, you can stop the ongoing program with control C. And with control D, you do a soft reboot, which actually then causes it to, to run the main file again. So th the point was that if you don't put it in the main file and leave the main file as is, you can connect to it you will get a terminal like this and then you can, from there you can say import master or import slave or run any Python code. That's the thing if you don't have the, if you're not a member of the dial out group, you don't have rights to use uh, connect to this device. You can, you can hack it. 
either you make yourself a member of the dial out group on Ubuntu, on uh, Arc Linux is a UUCP group, or you use sudo. Sudo always works. <laughs> Good. So, that was the first or second challenge. Are you ready for uh, the last one? Which is to actually build a network. And So probably the more easiest way is uh, if you just modify the main file and then do a reboot, as you like. So in order to set up a network, in the center we have this, um, this breadboard and we have, well, on either side we have a CAN bus. So a CAN bus network looks like this. You have uh, terminating resistors on each end um, because it's a differential bus. So what you need to do is to connect to it with your CAN transceiver. So the Pi board includes a CAN controller, which, is, which does all this frame um, processing and preparing. But then the signals that come out from the CAN controller look very much like UART signals. So just um, uh, voltage level, 3.3 .3 volt and so on. And the task of the CAN transceiver is to make a differential signal out of it. And the CAN transceiver is this shield which I put on top of it. It's really just a small device. And, you can, and it has two pins, CAN high and CAN low. So differential bus, you have two, two lines. So just agree on a, on a color maybe. Um, and then make sure that everyone is connecting the high line to the high line of the bus. If not... Um, it will just not work, uh, or if you this don't connect one of the lines, it will have a degraded performance, uh, but then you just swap it and see if it works. So it's not going to break the bus. Yeah. But this would be a design flaw, and even the best redundancy is not, cannot deal with design flaws. So. Screen command, yeah. So we're going to build two networks, one network per side, so three nodes would be uh, sitting on one bus, and one of you will be the master node, uh, which is then easy because you don't have to change anything, and the other ones, they will do the slave node, which in the main file, you import the slave.py. On of the CAN bus? It's not needed. Yeah. So there's no, there's no ground connection on this bus. So as you will see, we're not grounded together. Well, at some point we are maybe. Yes, let's see. Because the, the laptops are all galvanically disconnected. Yes, yeah. All on, or, yeah, most on battery, but some of those are... In an integrated flat. system, you will have... Then it might burn. <laughs> in an no, 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 I, I don't think so. It, it's a challenge, burn it. <laughs> <laughs> so when you do the real police, always connect. You mean the laptop will burn or the CAN transceiver? <laughs> yeah, maybe they all have separate grounds. 
workshop, they can be 100 volts different. <laughs> and <laughs> the data line is connecting. So as I said, for the master node, it's fairly simple. You just do the same thing and connect to the bus. But for the slave nodes, you have to look into the code because you need to set the, the ID. You cannot have, well, you can have two with the same ID, but it doesn't make sense. So one has to be set to one and the other one to, to two. In fact, in the master, in the code of the master, you define your own node ID, which must be set to zero because it's the master node. And here you define the number, uh, the IDs of the attached slave nodes, which is needed for this code here where you send telecommands to them. And this is basically the, the address of the node that you are sending the command to. For the slave node, You only need to set your node ID, that's all. So one of you sets it to one and the other one to two. So in a, in a real integrated cube, you would have a common ground. Uh, that's the point of Hannes, which is a very valid point. But for the sake of demo, we keep it simple and accept the risk of burning transceiver. Okay, we need to come to an end. Um, so just to give you an understanding of what code you're actually running, because it's all prepared and you're, um, this is the master code. Uh, it's initializing the everything, the, the, the can and so on. And then it's in a loop and checking if there was telemetry received from the slave nodes. And um, if so, then it prints this on the screen. Um, and then it also checks if, there, um, if a timer has expired, which is set to about five seconds or something. 
to send a telecommand, which contains the mode command. So it switches the other nodes on and off, basically, via this. So that's the loop, quite simple. On top of this, it's, that's via timers. It sends this heartbeat for the redundancy management, and it's sending a sync signal. And this is actually used then from the slave node. It always um, goes through this loop. It checks if there's the sync signal was received. And if so, so if not, so it stays here until it actually receives a sync. And during this time, during the waiting, basically checks if there was a telecommand received that it should execute. Telecommands are, let's say, it's a bit aperiodic, can happen at any time. And if there's a telecommand, it will run this command, execute it. In this case, it's a mode command, so it will be switched on or off. But once the sync is being received, it will start pre um, creating or preparing some basic telemetry, dummy telemetry, and send it back to the master. So with the sync, the master knows that every four, uh, every, no, every one second, it gets an update of telemetry from the slave nodes. And that's the whole idea, that you have a deterministic bus that is redundant and fail-safe. So let's see. So the master node is the blue one. This is working. The slave nodes, at least you should see the, the red blinking, which is the heartbeat. And on the terminal, you would see if it's, uh, if it's replying. Good. I think, uh, yeah, we stop here. Um, hope you had fun. And uh, I encourage you to also try it at home, but then with Ground Connected. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.